The acrid smell of burnt metal was the first thing that registered in Marcus Holt's foggy mind. His eyes fluttered open, squinting against the dim light filtering through the dusty windows of his workshop. The 50-year-old mechanic groaned, his body aching as he pushed himself up from the cold concrete floor. What the hell happened, he muttered, rubbing the back of his head where a sizable lump had formed. Marcus had called Novus Prime home for the past three decades. It was a frontier world, the farthest human colony from Earth, and life here had always been a bit rough around the edges. But it was home, and he'd carved out a good life for himself with his mechanical skills and sharp mind. As he stumbled to his feet, memories of the previous night came flooding back. He'd been working late, trying to finish repairs on old Mr. Johnson's hover truck. There had been a flash of light, a deafening roar, and then nothing. Marcus looked around his workshop, taking in the scattered tools and overturned workbench. It looked like a bomb had gone off, or maybe. Earthquake, he wondered aloud, though something in his gut told him this was worse. He'd always been a cautious man, some might even say paranoid. Living on the edge of human civilization had that effect on a person. It was why he'd become a prepper, stockpiling supplies and planning for every conceivable disaster. His friends had laughed at him, called him old-fashioned for not fully embracing the high-tech life of the colony. But right now, as he surveyed the damage to his shop, Marcus couldn't shake the feeling that his precautions might not have been so foolish after all. Stumbling towards the shop's entrance, Marcus's hand instinctively reached for the data pad in his pocket. The screen remained stubbornly dark, no matter how many times he tapped it. Damn things busted, he grumbled, pushing open the door. The sight that greeted him stole the breath from his lungs. Where once stood the bustling main street of New Helena, now lay a wasteland of rubble and twisted metal. Buildings he'd known for years were reduced to smoldering ruins. The ever-present hum of the colony's atmospheric processors was eerily absent, replaced by an oppressive silence. Marcus staggered out onto the street, his mind reeling as he tried to process the devastation before him. This was no earthquake. This was something far worse. Hello, he called out, his voice echoing off the ruins. Is anyone there? Only silence answered him. As the reality of his situation began to sink in, Marcus felt a chill run down his spine. The war that everyone had whispered about, the conflict that had seemed so distant on this far-flung world, had finally reached Novus Prime. And Marcus Holt, the old mechanic who had spent his life preparing for the worst, now found himself facing a nightmare beyond even his most pessimistic imaginings. Marcus stood in the middle of the ruined street, his eyes darting from one destroyed building to another. The devastation was total, extending as far as he could see. New Helena, once a bustling colony town of 50,000 souls, now lay silent and broken. This can't be happening, he muttered, his voice barely a whisper in the eerie quiet. As the initial shock began to wear off, Marcus's survival instincts kicked in. He needed to assess the situation, find out what happened, and look for other survivors. With determined steps, he began to make his way down the debris-strewn street. The destruction was methodical and thorough. It wasn't just bombs, there were signs of precision strikes. The Colonial Administration Building, the Communications Array, the power plant all reduced to twisted metal and shattered concrete. This was no random attack, it was a calculated strike to cripple the colony. As he rounded a corner, Marcus came face to face with the unmistakable evidence of war. A downed fighter craft, its sleek design, unlike anything in the Colonial Defense Force, lay embedded in the ruins of what used to be the local school. Its hull bore unfamiliar markings, definitely not human. Aliens Marcus breathed, the reality of the situation sinking in. The war that had been raging in the inner systems had finally reached their remote world. He approached the craft cautiously, noting the scorch marks and damage. Whatever brought it down had been powerful. There was no sign of the pilot, just a cockpit filled with strange, crystalline instruments, all dark and lifeless. As Marcus examined the alien craft, a glint of metal caught his eye. He reached down and picked up a familiar object, a colonial military-eyed tag. His heart sank as he read the name Sergeant Sandra Milton, Colonial Defense Force. They tried to fight back, he realized. The colonists hadn't gone down without a fight. 
But where was everyone now? The streets were empty, devoid of bodies or any signs of recent human activity. It was as if the entire population had vanished. Marcus made his way to the colony's main square, hoping to find some answers. The giant hollow screen that usually displayed news and announcements was dark, but a tattered poster fluttering in the wind caught his attention. Evacuation order it read in bold letters. All civilians report to designated shelters immediately. This is not a drill. The date on the poster made Marcus's blood run cold. It was dated three weeks ago. Three weeks, he said aloud, disbelief coloring his voice. I've been out for three weeks. The realization hit him like a physical blow. While he had lain unconscious in his workshop, his entire world had changed. The colony had been attacked, fought back, and then evacuated, leaving him behind. Marcus Holt, the cautious prepper who had spent his life preparing for disaster, now found himself utterly alone on a devastated alien world. As the sun began to set over the ruined cityscape, casting long shadows across the destruction, he felt the full weight of his isolation descend upon him. He was the last man on Novus Prime, a solitary figure in a sea of devastation, with no idea of what horrors the coming days might bring. As the shock of his situation began to subside, Marcus knew he couldn't afford to wallow in despair. He had to act, to search for any other survivors who might have been left behind like him. With the first light of dawn breaking over the ruined skyline, he set out on his grim task. Hello? Is anyone out there? Marcus called out as he made his way through the empty streets. His voice echoed off the broken buildings, met only by an eerie silence. He started with the residential areas, methodically checking each house and apartment building. Most were empty, showing signs of a hasty evacuation. Personal belongings were strewn about, meals left half-eaten on tables a haunting snapshot of lives interrupted. As he searched, Marcus couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The empty windows of the abandoned building seemed to stare back at him, adding to his growing unease. By midday, he had reached the hospital. If anyone had been left behind, surely they would be here. The entrance was blocked by debris, forcing Marcus to climb through a shattered window. Hello. Anyone here, he called out, his voice echoing through the empty corridors. The hospital was a maze of overturned gurneys and scattered medical supplies. In the maternity ward, Marcus found an incubator with a half-knitted baby blanket draped over it. The sight brought a lump to his throat. As he explored further, he came across the hospital's emergency bunker. The heavy blast doors stood open, revealing a space that had clearly been used recently. Cots were set up in neat rows, now empty. On a bulletin board, Marcus found a manifest of evacuees. His eyes scanned the list frantically, recognizing names of friends and neighbors. At the bottom, a note caught his attention, final evacuation complete. May God have mercy on those we couldn't save. The realization hit him like a physical blow. The evacuation was over. He truly was alone. Dejected, Marcus made his way back to the surface. As he emerged from the hospital, a glint of metal caught his eye. In a nearby parking lot, he spotted a functional-looking emergency vehicle. Hope surged within him as he approached the vehicle. Maybe he could use it to broadcast a distress signal or reach other parts of the colony. But as he tried to start it, he found that like every other piece of technology he'd encountered, it was completely dead. As the sun began to set on his first full day of consciousness in this new, empty world, Marcus trudged back towards his workshop. The search had yielded no survivors, no working technology, and no answers. Only more questions. He paused atop a hill overlooking the ruined city. In the fading light, he could see for miles in every direction. No lights flickered in the windows, no vehicles moved on the streets. The colony that had been his home for so long was now a ghost town. Marcus Holt, the last man on Novus Prime, stood alone in the gathering darkness. Tomorrow, he knew, he would need to start thinking about long-term survival. But for now, he allowed himself a moment to mourn for the world he had lost and the crushing solitude that stretched out before him. As the sun rose on his second day of solitude, Marcus knew he had to shift his focus from searching for survivors to ensuring his own survival. The realization that he was truly alone had settled in. 
leaving him with a grim determination to persist in this new, harsh reality. Back to basics, he muttered to himself as he surveyed his workshop. Way, way back. The first order of business was to gather supplies. With no functioning technology, Marcus was effectively thrown back to a pre-industrial age. He began by collecting anything that could be useful hand tools, manual pumps, mechanical parts that didn't rely on electronics. As he worked, Marcus couldn't help but feel a twinge of irony. All his life, he'd been seen as old-fashioned for his reliance on manual skills and non-electronic tools. Now those very skills might be the key to his survival. Venturing out into the city, Marcus began a systematic scavenging operation. He hit the hardware stores first, gathering axes, saws, hammers, and nails. In the farming supply shop, he found hand-powered water pumps and manual farming tools. Guess I'm going to become a farmer, he chuckled humorlessly to himself. The sporting goods store provided him with camping gear, a bow and arrows, and fishing equipment. In the ruins of the grocery stores, he managed to salvage some canned goods and dried foods that were still edible. As he worked, Marcus couldn't shake the eerie feeling of being a tomb raider in his own city. Every building he entered, every item he took, felt like a violation of the lives that had been lived here just weeks ago. By late afternoon, Marcus had amassed a significant cache of supplies. He'd repurposed an old cart from a construction site to haul his findings back to his workshop, which he'd decided would serve as his base of operations for the time being. As he organized his supplies, Marcus's mind raced with plans and calculations. How long could he survive on the canned goods? How would he purify water without the city's filtration systems? What would he do when the seasons changed? The questions were overwhelming, but Marcus forced himself to focus on the immediate future. He needed to secure shelter, establish a reliable food and water source, and find a way to defend himself if necessary. As night fell, Marcus lit a small fire in a metal drum outside his workshop. The dancing flames cast flickering shadows on the walls, reminding him of the countless nights he'd spent camping in the wilderness beyond the colony's borders. Those had been adventures, choices made for fun and challenge. This was different. This was survival. Sitting by the fire, eating a meager meal of canned beans, Marcus allowed himself to feel the full weight of his situation. He was alone on a dead world, armed with little more than his wits and whatever he could scavenge from the ruins of civilization. As he stared into the flames, Marcus Holt, the last man on Novus Prime, made a solemn vow to himself. He would survive. He would find a way to thrive in this new stone age. And someday, somehow, he would find a way off this planet and discover what had happened to his world. With that resolution burning in his heart, Marcus settled in for another night in his solitary new world, the silence of the ruined city, his only companion. As dawn broke on the third day, Marcus knew it was time to retrieve his most valuable resource, his prepper's cash. For years, he'd been stockpiling supplies in a hidden bunker beneath his home, preparing for a day he hoped would never come. Now, that day had arrived. Marcus made his way through the eerily quiet streets towards his old house. The familiar path felt alien now, littered with debris and evidence of the attack that had changed everything. As he rounded the corner onto his street, he paused, stealing himself for what he might find. His house, a modest two-story structure, stood relatively intact compared to some of its neighbors. The sight of it brought a lump to his throat, memories of happier times threatening to overwhelm him. But Marcus pushed those feelings aside. He had a job to do. Approaching the front door, he retrieved a key from under a fake rock old habits die hard. Inside, the house was a mess. It looked like it had been searched, probably during the evacuation efforts. Marcus made his way to the basement, his heart pounding with anticipation and fear. In the far corner of the basement, behind an old bookshelf, was a hidden door. Marcus pulled the shelf aside and entered a code into a manual lock, no electronics here. The door swung open, revealing a steep staircase descending into darkness. Marcus lit an old oil lamp and made his way down. At the bottom he found his sanctuary untouched. Shelves lined the walls, stocked with supplies, canned food, water purifiers, medical kits, tools, seeds, and more. Everything he needed to survive for months, maybe even years. Thank God, he whispered, relief washing over him. 
As he began to take inventory, Marcus's eye caught something that made his heart sink. His emergency radio, a high-powered device designed to work even in the worst conditions, was dark and lifeless. Whatever had knocked out the colony's electronics had affected even his shielded equipment. Pushing aside his disappointment, Marcus focused on what he did have. He spent hours organizing supplies, creating lists, and formulating plans. By the time he emerged from the bunker, laden with his most crucial supplies, the sun was setting. Back at his workshop, now serving as his base of operations, Marcus spread out his bounty. He had food, tools, and supplies. But more importantly, he had knowledge. Books on survival agriculture and basic medicine that he'd collected over the years now became his most prized possessions. As night fell, Marcus sat at his workbench, poring over his survival guides by lamplight. He sketched out plans for the coming days and weeks setting up rainwater collection systems, starting a garden, fortifying his position. The task ahead was daunting, but for the first time since waking up in this new reality, Marcus felt a glimmer of hope. He had prepared for this, even if he never truly believed it would happen. Now, his foresight might just keep him alive. As he settled in for the night, Marcus allowed himself a small smile. Tomorrow, he would begin the hard work of carving out a life in this new world. But tonight, he could rest easier knowing that he wasn't starting from nothing. In the quiet of the night, surrounded by the tools of his survival, Marcus Holt, the last man on Novus Prime, drifted off to sleep, dreaming of the challenges and possibilities that lay ahead. A week had passed since Marcus's awakening, and he had settled into a routine of sorts. Each day was a struggle for survival, but his prepper instincts and supplies had served him well. However, on the eighth day, he noticed something that sent a chill down his spine. Marcus woke to an unusually dry, scratchy feeling in his throat. As he stepped outside his workshop, he realized the air felt different, thinner, drier. The ever-present humidity that had been a hallmark of Novus Prime's terraformed atmosphere was noticeably absent. This isn't right, he muttered, looking up at the sky with growing concern. Marcus knew the planet's atmosphere was maintained by a network of massive terraforming machines. These devices not only regulated the air's composition, but also added the necessary moisture to make the planet habitable, if they had stopped working. With a sense of urgency, Marcus set out to investigate. He made his way to the nearest terraforming station, a huge structure on the outskirts of the city. As he approached, the silence was deafening. The usual hum of machinery was absent. Inside the station, Marcus found what he feared most. The massive machines were silent, their control panels dark. Whatever had knocked out the colony's electronics had affected these crucial systems as well. No, 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 Marcus whispered the gravity of the situation sinking in. He knew enough about the terraforming process to understand the implications. Without these machines running, the carefully balanced atmosphere would begin to deteriorate. The moisture would dissipate, the oxygen levels would drop, and eventually the planet would revert to its original, uninhabitable state. Marcus rushed back to his workshop, his mind racing. He needed to find a way to restart the terraforming machines or at least slow down the atmospheric degradation. But how? He was a mechanic, not a terraforming engineer. As he pored over the few technical manuals he had, Marcus realized the enormity of the task. The terraforming systems were far too complex for one man to operate or repair, especially without power or specialized equipment. Looking out the window, he could already see signs of the changing atmosphere. The plants in a nearby park were starting to wilt, their leaves curling in the increasingly dry air. In the distance, a thin haze was forming on the horizon the first signs of the planet's protective bubble breaking down. Marcus slumped in his chair, the weight of his situation crushing down on him. He had survived the attack, the isolation, the technological collapse. But this? This was beyond his abilities to fix. For the first time since waking up in this nightmare, Marcus felt truly hopeless. His days were numbered, and there was nothing he could do about it. Unless he could find a way off this dying world, he was doomed to watch as the planet slowly became uninhabitable around him. As night fell, Marcus stood outside, looking up at the stars. Somewhere out there was the rest of humanity, oblivious to his plight. He wondered if anyone would ever return to Novus Prime, 
or if he would be the last person to ever set foot on this world. With a heavy heart, Marcus retreated to his workshop. He needed a plan, and fast. Whether it was finding a way to fix the terraforming machines or escaping the planet altogether, he knew he was in a race against time. The dying world of Novus Prime wouldn't wait for him to catch up. Marcus spent a sleepless night weighing his options. By dawn, he had come to a difficult decision he needed to journey to the colony's capital city, New Athens, some 200 miles away. If there was any hope of restarting the terraforming systems or finding a way off planet, it would be there. As the sun rose on a sky that seemed a shade paler than the day before, Marcus began his preparations. He converted an old off-road vehicle to run on manual power, essentially creating a large, fortified bicycle. It wasn't fast, but it was better than walking. He packed his vehicle with supplies water, canned food, tools, weapons, and his most crucial survival gear. As a last-minute thought, he added a few book survival guides, technical manuals, and a worn copy of Robinson Crusoe that had been a gift from his father. Before leaving, Marcus took one last look at the place he'd called home for so long. Goodbye, new Helena, he said softly, his voice carrying in the eerie silence. The journey began on what used to be the main highway connecting the colonial cities. Now, it was a broken path through a deteriorating landscape. Bridges were down, forcing Marcus to find alternate routes. The road itself was cracked and buckled in places, evidence of the violent attack that had reshaped this world. As he pedaled, Marcus couldn't help but notice the signs of the planet's rapid decline. Trees that had once been lush and green were now browning their leaves curling in the increasingly arid air. Small streams that used to run alongside the road were already drying up. The first day of travel was grueling. The manual vehicle was harder to operate than Marcus had anticipated, and the debris-strewn road made progress slow. By nightfall, he had covered only 30 miles. He made camp in the shell of an abandoned way station, his campfire the only light for miles around. As he ate his meager dinner of canned beans, Marcus tried to stay positive. One day down, he said to himself, just a few more to go. But as he settled in for the night, the absolute silence of the dead world around him was oppressive. There were no insects chirping, no night birds calling, not even the rustle of wind through leaves. Just silence, as if the planet itself was holding its breath. Marcus lay awake for hours, staring at the unfamiliar stars through a hole in the station's roof. He thought about the enormity of his task, the millions of things that could go wrong. But most of all, he thought about the crushing loneliness of being the last man on a dying world. As he finally drifted off to sleep, Marcus Holt, the reluctant explorer of a dead planet, dreamed of green fields and bustling cities. In his dreams, he wasn't alone. But he knew that when he woke, the harsh reality of his solitary journey would be waiting for him. The road to New Athens stretched out before him, a path through a withering world. Whether it led to salvation or just prolonged his inevitable fate, only time would tell. But Marcus was determined to see it through, one grueling mile at a time. As Marcus pushed on towards New Athens, the signs of Novus Prime's decay became increasingly apparent. Each day brought new evidence of the planet's regression to its pre-terraformed state. On the third day of his journey, Marcus crested a hill to find a once lush valley spread out before him. What should have been a vibrant green landscape was now a tapestry of browns and grays. The forest that had covered the valley floor was withering away, leaves falling in a premature autumn. It's happening faster than I thought, Marcus muttered, wiping sweat from his brow. The air was noticeably thinner now, making physical exertion more challenging. He pressed on, his makeshift vehicle creaking under the strain. As he traversed the dying valley, Marcus couldn't help but feel a profound sense of loss. This world, which humanity had worked so hard to make habitable, was slipping away before his eyes. On the fifth day, he came across a colonial farm. The crops were already dead, rows of withered plants stretching to the horizon. The farm's irrigation system, once a marvel of terraforming technology, lay silent and useless. Marcus scavenged what he could from the farmhouse finding some preserved foods and a detailed map of the region. As he was leaving, something caught his eye, a single green shoot pushing up through the dry soil. He knelt down, examining the stubborn little plant. 
You're a tough one, aren't you, he said, a small smile crossing his face. On impulse, he carefully dug up the plant and its surrounding soil, placing it in a container he'd found in the farmhouse. If nothing else, it would be a companion on his journey. As the days wore on, the planet's deterioration accelerated. Streams and rivers Marcus had counted on for water were drying up, forcing him to ration his supplies carefully. The wildlife, already scarce, had all but disappeared. The silence was now complete, broken only by the creaking of his vehicle and his own labored breathing. On the eighth day, a dust storm hit. The topsoil, no longer held in place by vegetation, was lifted by hot, dry winds. Marcus was forced to take shelter in the ruins of a roadside diner, watching through grimy windows as the world outside was engulfed in swirling red dust. That night, as he huddled in his makeshift shelter, Marcus felt the full weight of his situation descend upon him. He was witnessing the death of an entire world, a process that should take millennia happening in a matter of weeks. Is this how it ends, he wondered aloud, his voice swallowed by the howling wind outside. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. As he drifted off to an uneasy sleep, Marcus clutched the container with the small green plant. It was a reminder that life, however fragile, could be incredibly resilient. In the morning he would continue his journey, carrying with him perhaps the last living plant on Novus Prime. The road ahead was long and the planet was dying, but Marcus Holt pushed on. New Athens awaited, and with it, the slim hope of salvation not just for himself, but for this withering world he now carried with him. After twelve grueling days of travel, Marcus finally caught sight of New Athens on the horizon. The colonial capital, once a shining beacon of human achievement on this distant world, now stood as a silent monument to their absence. As he approached the city outskirts, Marcus felt a mix of relief and apprehension. The skyline, dominated by the massive planetary administration building, was intact but lifeless. No lights flickered in the windows, no vehicles moved on the streets. Well, here goes nothing, Marcus muttered to himself as he peddled his makeshift vehicle into the city proper. The streets of New Athens were in better condition than those of New Helena, but signs of the attack were still evident. Scorch marks marred some buildings, and abandoned vehicles littered the roads. Marcus made his way towards the city center, his eyes constantly scanning for any sign of movement or life. As he approached the planetary administration building, Marcus's heart began to race. If there were any answers to be found, any hope of restarting the terraforming systems or contacting off-world help, it would be here. The building's main entrance was sealed shut, but Marcus found a side door that yielded to his pry bar. As he stepped inside, the musty air and absolute silence sent a chill down his spine. This place, once bustling with colonial officials and bureaucrats, was now a tomb. Marcus made his way through darkened corridors, his flashlight beam revealing abandoned workstations and scattered documents. He found his way to the central control room, a vast chamber filled with now silent terminals and dark screens. Come on, he muttered, frantically searching for any sign of power or life in the complex systems. But like everything else on this world, the heart of the colony's administration was dead and silent. As the reality of his situation sank in, Marcus slumped into a chair, the weight of his journey and his dwindling hopes crushing down on him. He had come all this way, endured so much, only to find more silence, more abandonment. But as he sat there, surrounded by the ghosts of a once thriving colony, Marcus's eyes fell on something that rekindled a spark of hope. In a corner of the room, partially hidden behind a console, was a manual emergency beacon the kind designed to work even in the most extreme conditions. With renewed energy, Marcus rushed to the beacon. It was old technology, designed as a last resort option, but it might be his only chance. He began the laborious process of setting it up, his hands shaking with a mixture of exhaustion and excitement. As night fell over the dead city, Marcus worked tirelessly to activate the beacon. He had no way of knowing if the signal would reach anyone, if there was anyone out there still listening. But it was something, a small act of defiance against the silence and isolation that had become his world. Finally, with a series of clicks and a low hum, the beacon came to life. A small red light blinked steadily, the only sign of active technology Marcus had seen since waking up in this nightmare. Exhausted but filled with a cautious hope, 
Marcus made camp in the control room. As he drifted off to sleep, the steady blink of the beacon was a comforting presence in the darkness. Whether it would bring salvation or just confirm his isolation, only time would tell. But for now Marcus Holt, the last man on Novus Prime, allowed himself to hope. In this dead city, at the heart of a dying world, he had taken his first real step towards potential rescue. The beacon's signal streamed out into the void, carrying with it the desperate plea of a lone survivor on a withering planet. The next morning, Marcus woke with a renewed sense of purpose. The emergency beacon can continue its steady blink, a small beacon of hope in the vast silence of the dead city. But hope alone wouldn't be enough. He needed answers, and he knew where to find them. Making his way to the colonial archives, Marcus found the doors sealed. It took him hours of work with his tools to finally breach the entrance. Inside, rows upon rows of data storage units greeted him, holding the colony's entire history. All right, he muttered, let's see what happened here. Marcus had basic knowledge of the archive systems from his time as a mechanic. He located a manual interface and began the painstaking process of retrieving information without power. It was slow, tedious work, but gradually, the story of Novus Prime's fall began to emerge. The attack had come swiftly and without warning. An unknown alien force had descended upon the colony, systematically targeting key infrastructure. The colonial defense force had been overwhelmed within hours. As he dug deeper, Marcus discovered a chilling truth. The attackers hadn't just bombed the colony, they had deployed a sophisticated weapon that specifically targeted electronic systems. This explained why even shielded and backup systems had failed. That's why nothing works, Marcus realized, his heart sinking. It wasn't just an EMP. They rewrote the very laws of electronics on this planet. The implications were staggering. Not only could he not fix the terraforming machines, but he also couldn't hope to repair any complex technology. Novus Prime was effectively thrust back into a pre-industrial age. But the worst revelation was yet to come. As Marcus accessed the final transmissions from the colonial government, he learned the full extent of the evacuation. In the chaos of the attack, and with limited spacecraft, they had only managed to evacuate a fraction of the population. Thousands had been left behind, presumably to die in the aftermath. They knew Marcus whispered, his voice breaking. They knew and they left anyway. The final transmission was a grim acknowledgement of the colony's fate. With the terraforming systems destroyed and no hope of immediate rescue, the colonial leadership had made the heart-wrenching decision to abandon Novus Prime entirely. Marcus sat back, overwhelmed by the weight of what he'd learned. He wasn't just the last man on a dying planet, he was one of thousands who had been sacrificed in a desperate bid to save what could be saved. As night fell once again, Marcus found himself staring out a window at the silent city. The emergency beacon continued its steady blink, but now it felt less like hope and more like a futile gesture against the vastness of space and the finality of abandonment. Marcus Holt, the last known survivor on a world consigned to death, faced the grimmest night of his life. The revelations of the day had shattered his hopes for rescue or restoration. As he contemplated his future on this doomed planet, he wondered if perhaps those who had died in the initial attack had been the lucky ones. With a heavy heart, he retreated to his makeshift camp in the control room, the steady blink of the beacon his only companion in a world of silence and fading hope. The weight of the revelations bore down on Marcus like a physical force. For days, he barely moved from his spot in the control room, the steady blink of the emergency beacon a cruel reminder of his dwindling hopes. The grim reality of his situation had finally fully set in. He was truly alone, abandoned on a dying world with no hope of rescue or restoration. As the days blurred together, Marcus fell into a deep depression. He stopped his daily routines, barely eating or drinking. The small plant he had carried with him from the farm wilted, neglected in its container. In his darkest moments, Marcus contemplated ending it all. Why prolong the inevitable? But something, some stubborn spark of life, kept him going, even if just barely. On the fifth day of his isolation in the control room, Marcus finally stirred. He looked at his reflection in a darkened computer screen, a haggard, bearded face stared back at him, 
eyes hollow with despair. Is this how it ends, he asked his reflection. Is this all that's left of Marcus Holt? Slowly, painfully, Marcus began to move. He stood up, his joints creaking in protest. He made his way to the wilting plant and, almost mechanically, began to care for it. As he tended to the small green shoot, something shifted inside him. We're still here, he said to the plant. We're not done yet. Over the next few days, Marcus went through a process of acceptance. He mourned for the world he had lost, for the people who had died or been left behind. He mourned for the future he would never have. But as he worked through his grief, a new resolve began to form. He might be the last man on Novus Prime, but he was still alive. And as long as he drew breath, he had a responsibility to himself, to the memory of the colony, and to the small spark of life he carried with him. Marcus began to plan. He couldn't save the planet, couldn't restart the terraforming machines or call for a rescue that would never come. But he could document what had happened here. He could leave a record for whatever beings might one day find this abandoned world. He gathered writing materials and began to chronicle the fall of Novus Prime and his own journey since waking up in this new reality. He wrote of the attack, the evacuation, and the slow death of a once vibrant world. As he wrote, Marcus felt a sense of purpose returning. He was no longer just surviving, he was bearing witness. He was ensuring that the story of Novus Prime and all those who had lived and died here would not be forgotten. On the tenth day since his arrival in New Athens, Marcus packed up his belongings. He had made his peace with his fate, and now it was time to move on. He didn't know how much time he had left, but he was determined to make it count. With one last look at the silent control room and the still-blinking emergency beacon, Marcus Holt stepped out into the dying world. He had mourned, he had accepted, and now he would live for however long he had left, he would live. The road ahead was uncertain, but for the first time since discovering the truth about Novus Prime's abandonment, Marcus felt a glimmer of hope. Not for rescue or salvation, but for the possibility of finding meaning in the time he had left. Marcus had been traveling for three days, making his way back towards New Helena. He had decided to return to his old workshop to live out whatever time he had left in familiar surroundings. The journey was harder than before the air was thinner, the heat more intense, and the landscape more barren. On the morning of the fourth day, Marcus woke to something unexpected moisture on his face. He opened his eyes, blinking in confusion. A light drizzle was falling from the sky. What the, he muttered, stepping out from his makeshift shelter. The rain was gentle but persistent, the first precipitation he'd seen since waking up in this nightmare. As he stood there, letting the water wash over him, Marcus noticed something else the air felt different. It was still thin, but not as dry as it had been. Puzzled and hopeful, Marcus quickened his pace towards New Helena. As he traveled, he noticed small changes in the landscape. Patches of brown grass seemed a shade greener. A few hardy plants were showing new growth. Two days later, as he approached the outskirts of New Helena, Marcus made a startling discovery. The large terraforming station he had investigated weeks ago was humming faintly. It wasn't fully operational, but something had changed. Marcus rushed inside, his heart pounding. The main control panels were still dark, but auxiliary systems showed signs of life. It took him hours of investigation to piece together what had happened. The terraforming machines, it seemed, had a fail-safe system so deeply ingrained in their core programming that even the alien attack couldn't fully disable it. When atmospheric conditions reached a critical level, this backup system had kicked in, running on minimal power to prevent total planetary collapse. It wasn't a full revival the planet was still dying, but much more slowly now. The machines were buying time, stabilizing the atmosphere just enough to slow the decay. Marcus sat on the floor of the terraforming station, overwhelmed by this unexpected reprieve. He wasn't saved, not by a long shot, but he had more time than he'd thought. Months, maybe even years, rather than weeks. As the realization sank in, Marcus felt a renewed sense of purpose flood through him. He might not be able to save the planet or himself in the long run, but he could do something with this gift of time. He thought of the small plant he'd carried with him, now thriving in its container thanks to the rain and improved air quality. 
Perhaps with careful planning and hard work, he could preserve more of Novus Prime's life. Marcus Holt stood up, a plan already forming in his mind. He would create a sanctuary, a protected space where he could nurture the remaining plant and animal life of this world. It wouldn't save the planet, but it would be a legacy, a final act of defiance against the dying of the light. As he stepped out of the terraforming station, Marcus looked up at the sky. The drizzle had stopped, but clouds still hung low, promising more rain to come. For the first time in weeks, he smiled. The road ahead was still long and ultimately final, but this unexpected reprieve had given Marcus something he'd thought lost forever hope. Not for rescue or a miraculous salvation, but for the chance to make his remaining time matter. With renewed energy, Marcus set off towards his old workshop. He had work to do, a sanctuary to build, and a world's legacy to preserve. The last man on Novus Prime was not done yet, not by a long shot. Over the next few weeks, Marcus threw himself into his new mission with vigor. His workshop became the center of operations for what he now called Project Legacy. The goal was simple yet monumental to preserve as much of Novus Prime's remaining life as possible. Marcus's first task was to convert his workshop and the surrounding area into a controlled environment. He used his mechanical skills to create rudimentary air filtration systems and water recyclers. It wasn't perfect, but it created a small oasis in the slowly dying world. With his sanctuary taking shape, Marcus began his most challenging task collecting specimens. He embarked on expeditions into the surrounding areas, carefully gathering seeds, cuttings, and even small animals that had managed to survive. Each day brought new challenges and small victories. He successfully germinated seeds from various plant species in his makeshift greenhouse. A pair of small, rodent-like creatures native to Novus Prime found a home in a habitat he built. Even insects, crucial for pollination, were carefully collected and introduced to his sanctuary. As weeks turned into months, Marcus's project grew. He expanded his operations, creating additional controlled environments in nearby buildings. His days were filled with constant work maintaining systems, caring for his growing collection of life, and meticulously documenting everything. One morning, about six months into his project, Marcus made a discovery that brought tears to his eyes. In a small pond he had created, he found eggs from an amphibian species he thought extinct. It was a small victory, but to Marcus, it represented everything he was fighting for. Life finds a way, he said to himself, smiling as he carefully protected the eggs. As he worked, Marcus couldn't help but reflect on the irony of his situation. He had spent his life preparing for disaster, always expecting the worst. Now, in the face of the ultimate catastrophe, he found himself working tirelessly to nurture life. A year passed, then two. The planet outside his sanctuary continued its slow decline, but within his protected zones, life thrived. Marcus had created a living archive of Novus Prime's ecosystem, a testament to the world that once was. On the second anniversary of his awakening in this changed world, Marcus stood on the roof of his workshop, surveying his creation. Green growth spread out before him, a stark contrast to the barren landscape beyond. The sound of animal life, once extinct in this area, now filled the air. As he stood there, Marcus felt a deep sense of peace. He knew that his time, and the time of this world, was limited. The terraforming machines were fighting a losing battle against the planet's regression. One day, perhaps not too far in the future, Novus Prime would become uninhabitable. But Marcus had done something profound. He had created a legacy, a final record of this world's unique life, and he had found purpose in the face of unimaginable loneliness and despair. Marcus Holt, the last man on Novus Prime, had become more than just a survivor. He was now a guardian, a caretaker of an entire world's legacy. As he watched the sun set on another day in his sanctuary, he felt, for the first time in years, truly at peace. The future was uncertain, but for now, in this small corner of a dying world, life continued. And as long as he drew breath, Marcus would ensure that the spirit of Novus Prime lived on. Thank you so much for listening to this story. I hope you loved it. Please remember to subscribe if you did like it so you can see more videos like this. And please give us a like and a comment too. I'll see you in the next one.